Hey, you two. So if you run your own creative business, I'm sure you've heard this phrase. It's easy to start a business and it's hard to scale it. On today's video, we are going to talk about all about scaling. And I'm going to share with you the lesson that I learned in first year running my creative business, which is scaling is a myth. Before we get started though, I want to remind you to subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't. This channel is all about sharing creative resources on how to manage creative career and creative practice. And if you're new here, I also want to remind you that this is a video series that I'm sharing from the first year of running my creative business and they're free videos and I already shared two other lessons. But don't click to those two videos yet. Finish watching this video and then go watch the other two videos. So today I want to talk to you about the lesson that I learned in the first year of my creative business, which is scaling is a myth. And to start this conversation, I just want to preface by saying I actually recorded this video several times because this is a concept that I find quite frankly quite abstract to explain. And I've been kind of digging why it's important for myself to share this lesson with you and what is the true motivation behind it. And as I do a little bit more thinking, I think it actually has to relate to my past experience even before I became a creative business owner. My past experience in when people are asking about my creative career, there's this sense that as creators, our values or our worth are defined by the output or the amount of like creative ideas that we have and constantly we are being asked to produce more and there is never this contentment with the presence or enoughness. I remember you know one of the questions that when I ever I go to a networking events people will ask is without thinking right like they would ask what's the next project you're working on and I like if you follow me for a while you know that I deeply deeply resent that question and I tend to not ask other people just that question especially creative people too because I often think why is it that we always need to chase for the next thing logically I know that uh, there's a career reason or a business or strategic reason that we always have like on our back pocket the next project or the ideas on how we can grow our career. But I also think that that kind of mentality is what got me early on in my career of feel, constantly feeling not enough and eventually led to burnout. And I believe that that is the same for many creators. And in our career maintenance, especially for a creative career, Maintenance seems to be such a bad word. Why is that? I don't have a great answer for that I, other than just the hustle culture and again how creatives are defined and our value, our worth are defined. And I think that past experience informed me as I developed my creative business. I'm very conscious of the fact that I build this solo practice not to reinforce some of the things that I didn't like, but rather build a structure that's right for me for the growth that I want. So when I started out in last year, February 2022, when I shifted from having a job, having a side hustle, having a filmmaking practice to full-time running my multifaceted creative business and on my own. I also heard a similar narrative from the questions that I get in terms of like encouraging scaling or encouraging the kind of expansion and growth that I wasn't necessarily looking for. I had family and friends like kind of congratulating me and the first thing they would say is like, I hope you grow big or, oh, I hope that you grow a company and eventually have employees or like, what's the next thing you're gonna do with your coaching? Are you going to develop a course with like for many people so that like you can have passive income? And those questions, like, first of all, I want to say to whoever posed those questions to me, 
I don't blame those questions and the intention behind it. I think it always has a good intention. But frankly, they, I think when I face that question, it gives me a pause, right? And the pause comes from, again, that past experience of always not enough. You reach a milestone of founding a business and it's not enough. Think about scaling because otherwise you fall behind. You make a film, it's not enough. What's the next film that you're going to make? Because otherwise you're not like constantly evolving. I really want to build a practice on my own and support other people to build a practice that's kind of challenging that status quo. I want to encourage all of us to think about what growth actually means for us and the definition of growth does not have to be productivity, achievement, but rather the holistic growth of us as people and as creative people. And that I think is an important lesson I've learned in my career and I continue to confront with it and understand the different nuance of that in the business. And yes, it boils down to scaling is a myth, but really what it really means is define what growth means to you and prioritize that. Um, I will give you a concrete example. So in the first year of my creative business, what I did not do was thinking about the traditional ways of like scaling, right? Uh, which is, I did not think about like building a course. I did not think about like making profit out of like some resources I share. But what I did think about was I want to continue to deepen my craft in coaching and especially one-on-one -on -one coaching and hold space for that. And in order to do that, when I look at my capacity, one of the conscious decisions that I make last year was stepping back from some of my big consulting projects. And that in itself is, I would like to say, a bold decision because it had a financial impact. Um, and it doesn't necessarily pay off in terms of like profits or achievement right away, right? Because what does even deepening my craft mean? But I'm so glad that I made that decision because it did give me the freedom and space to, for example, even deepen my learning in coaching and or for example, think have the space to think freely about what kind of resources I want to create and how I want to communicate with my audience and my clients. Other thing as I have thought about my growth is I always return to the grounding values and the grounding needs that I care about in my life. And the word that comes up again and again for me is flexibility. Flexibility means a couple of things. Location flexibility, time flexibility, and for me, the creative flexibility to switch lane whenever I want to between my filmmaking, consulting, and coaching. So when I think about that, the decision or the structure of having a solo business is really a product of my value and my need, not a driving force for it, if that makes sense. So I never want to build structure for the sake of it or maintain structure for the sake of it. When I'm the person that care about flexibility and that's the like one of the top reasons that I founded this business. One of the things that I did last year as well was that I consciously wanted to remind myself that flexibility I was able to build for myself and I took a month off in December and travel around the world. And that felt so good in terms of like giving myself the almost the biggest evidence that, oh yeah, I can do this. I said that I believe or I care about this value, flexibility, and I build a business based on that. And there is an outcome, the traveling, the, the time off, 
that I enjoy, not only in my work, but in my life. So I think that peace and that drive for flexibility will continue to be a grounding value of my practice. And sure, life change and needs change and, and like our life's context change. And so I can't say for sure one day I would never like or ever think about building a course or uh, having employee. Those decisions in and of itself are neutral. Actually, any business strategy or any kind of like creative strategy is neutral. When we make them, I think we just have to assess that, am I making this decision based on my values and my needs and my mission? Or am I making this decision because I'm experiencing FOMO and falling for the trap of what should I be doing? Or falling for the trap of other people are doing that all the time. Why am I not doing that in my practice? That's the hard question that I think that we constantly have to ask ourselves, especially when we are solo. And that's something that I also learned as a solo practitioner because unlike in a job, no one is telling you what to think about, right? Uh, in a job, there's like a perceived structure of like, here's the task that your employer is giving you. And if you finish that and you do that with excellence, that's great. Um, whereas in when you're on your own, what growth means and what's right is all completely defined by yourself. So to end off this lesson on skilling is a myth or whether what growth means for a creative practitioner, I want to give you a framework that I developed by working with my clients who are also other creative practitioners and creative business owners and also I for my own personal experience. This framework kind of gives like three anchors that define or the three common anchors that define what success and growth for creative practitioners mean. And I hope that it gives you a more expansive picture than just what we traditionally think of business success and achievements. The three anchors are one, creative fulfillment, second, impact, and third, profit. And I don't mean to organize them in that chronological order. They're equally important or rather you can decide how they're playing different roles or the ratio of the importance in your own practice. So let's break them down one by one. So the first one, creative fulfillment. A lot of us got into our creative endeavor because we care about our connection with our creativity and we care about having that freedom to do the creative acts that we love. But often what I observe is once we get into the business of things, we lose that connection or we lose that spiritual act of doing creative things that we value so much. We value so much that we chose a career that admittedly is often seen as not profitable or not uh, successful in society. And yet, once we get into like doing it full time, the irony is we lose that, like, I almost want to say divine connection with our creative self. So when we're evaluating success in our creative practice, I think is integral to for us to think about how much creative fulfillment are we getting? Not necessarily in every single ounce of our practice, but in terms of when we look at our work, what's the ratio of creative fulfillment are you getting? And also, are you allowing yourself to follow creative impulse that at times don't necessarily make business sense? This is again best illustrated with example. And this is a little bit of a meta example, which is this exact thing that I'm doing right now this year, I'm trying to put some, refine my podcast, but also uh, produce video content for the resources and content I'm putting out to the world and launch this YouTube channel. For a little while last month, I actually really tried to force fit a business reason behind it. And I could not, in the, 
really figure out a reason. Uh, the best reason that I came up was actually uh, come from a dear friend uh, who told me that, um, you know, producing business co uh, content on video can provide a wider accessibility to your audience, which I completely agree and value. But if I were the honest with myself, there's a part of me really just want to create video content. And I cannot explain why. Maybe it's because it's the time, season in my life that I want to practice more of like video production. I have a love for editing. Uh, I don't know whether you folks know. Uh, one of the like most enjoyable thing for me when I started out as a, as a filmmaker was not directing, was not cinematography, but editing. And I've been really enjoying editing these videos. And perhaps that's the reason, but I don't know. Eventually, I just kind of like meditate on it and face my own impulse. You know what? It's okay to give in your creative impulse. There's no uh, rational reason, but didn't you build this practice to give your space to follow your heart? So that is a little bit of my personal example of like when we are in the business of doing things, sometimes it can feel confusing when our creative impulse come. I think it's so critical that we have that space to be able to follow the impulse. Again, it's about managing the right ratio between having impulse and having strategy. So moving on to the second anchor, which is impact. Impact can mean a dimension of different things. It can mean personal impact. It can mean artistic impact if you're an artist. It can also mean communal impact and systemic impact. Whenever I talk to creatives and work with them one-on-one -on -one in my coaching room, very, very rarely, actually never, and maybe just I don't attract that kind of clients, almost every instance in a two-hour coaching onboarding conversation, we are able to get down to their impact statement. What is the kind of change they want to make, whether it's artistic, change, artistic process, artistic style related, or is a social change that they want to make in the world and or in, bring an impact or contribute to. Those kind of things sometimes feels like luxury when we are burned out or we are busy working in the day to day, but they are the higher purpose that drive us on a rainy day. On, in the times that we struggle and don't see the end of the tunnel, it's so important to have the evaluation of what our impact is. Again, I want to give a personal example that when I think about my coaching practice, I have a lot of people in the past year, and perhaps this is no surprise to you, uh, other people have asked me, why are you just focusing on artists? Um, I don't be, mean to be offense, but they don't often make a lot of money. Uh, and for me, the answer has always been very clear. It is not that I don't have respect or interest in the other as facets of the world, but as someone who has come from the arts and is creative myself, I really know and deeply feel the need of wanting to support other creative artists because I know how hard it can be and how long it can be on that journey. And when I became a coach or better, when I got trained as a coach, I look around and I really don't see that many coaches out there that are supporting people who are in the arts or in the creative fields, especially for a person of color to be working in this arena. So that higher purpose was what drove me to add this link in my practice from the day one, and it's not going to change. It might evolve as I develop more nuances and understanding of like creators. For example, like 
at the beginning, I think I just said, I broadly do career coaching for all creators. And I just want to go out and coach. But now, I think even my own offering and practice, I've refined it into like different streams or different um, messaging because I understand if you've been creators, creative solopreneur or solo practitioner have very different needs from someone who has a job and want to make a shift in either jumping from industry to industry or finding a next aligned career direction. So those are nuances that develop, but notice my impact or my purpose did not change. And I actually think if I don't have that impact driving, like that higher purpose or impact driving me, I probably won't bother. It's not really easy to build a practice from scratch, especially for coaching. I, unlike fundraising consulting, I don't really have an extensive network um, and sometimes feel like I don't have guidance either. So I have to actively go seek out professional development, depending on my craft, and uh, depending my understanding of the creative work landscape. Again, that's a personal example of what impact means. And I want to encourage you to think about what impact means in your own practice and process. And again, they don't have to be this grand communal impact. They can be an impact that is for a craft, a specific craft, a specific field, or artistic process that you're working on. Last but not least, I have and must stress about this domain of profit. And it's interesting that I'm bringing in this conversation because I think if we are talking about the financial field or like any kind of other business, this domain is like a no-brainer. But for people in the arts or other creatives, we often have this feeling that, okay, if we fulfill our creative like fulfillment, and we have impact, it's okay. It's okay that my practice doesn't make money. I hear that so often, and I've heard it from my own inner voice over the years, and I really want to just, I wish I can like just have a big hammer and shatter that myth completely. The reason for that is I'm not encouraging you to go out and say, go become like a rich millionaire that's heartless. For some reason, like whenever like people in the arts think about money, that it's so easy for us to jump to that, the other side and think about the heartless, like so, soulless uh, rich people. And it's not about that. What I observe, and I know you know, is that people in the arts are barely even making their ends meet. And for a lot of us who uh, have immigrant backgrounds, the values from our family, the wanting to be able to have a stable life and provide for our family, is a real need. It's not a need that we can just like dismiss. And I, w I almost say the starving artist kind of image or uh, archetype, it's very detrimental to our psychological health for all, but especially with those that uh, come from a family that have a real need to provide. And in my coaching world, never want to dismiss the wish to have a stable financial foundation. And beyond that, it is completely okay to want to live a holistically wealthy life. And a holistic and wealthy life, it does not mean uh, disobeying or going against your value of uh, not wanting to support highly, highly capitalistic or highly, highly unethical business out there. It just means that you get to define what is a good life for you. And in order to achieve that, what is the amount of resources or financial resources you need to make. And you'd be surprised in my practice of like coaching creatives. In my practice of coaching creatives, 
sometimes when I pose that question, well, you feel that you're not making money at all, or you feel constantly burned out of suffering from a financial loss or not making ends meet. But what would be the amount that you want to make? Can you make break down a budget for me? That how does that translate in your life wants and needs? It's a very difficult exercise. I've never heard someone uh, in my coaching room being able to come up with an answer. Oh, I have it right here, buddy. Uh, whether it's for my life or for my business, here's the budget. I think that reason for that is because we don't talk about it enough, and we don't know how to put benchmark around it, and it's real stigma in the creative practice or creative field. So when we are thinking about growth and thinking about success for creative practice and business, is integral a must have to think about this domain. The earlier example that I gave about stepping back from a consulting project to focus on my coaching. I did not make that choice if I didn't know that financially I was able to take that risk. So I'm very, very conscious when you continue to hear me being conscious of valuing how important money is in our career, in our practice, in our business, because it is, and I, in some way, I think having artistic and creative people being able to talk about this is truly an act of changing our industry and the ways that we conduct ourselves and being able to bring about the impact that I want to see in the sector. Before I go off and like basically go on a venting fest, I hope that you now see that framework of the three anchors that I've developed basically just synthesize from working with creators and from my own experience. And I hope that you can take this and now apply to your own practice, looking from the lens of these three circles. In what dimensions are your practice and your own business meeting some of these requirements, meeting some of these success metrics? And in what dimension is it lacking? And in some seasons, it's okay to say I'm focusing on this area because it needs me to be like hundred percent full force on this and be less less focused on the other areas. But I encourage you to always think about a certain level of balance between the three of them. If there's one takeaway that you're taking away from this episode, I hope that is that you get to define what success and growth means in your own creative practice. And that's the beauty of running your own solo practice, but sometimes it can feel like a curse too, and I understand that. This is why I continue on to provide resources and create more content for you on this podcast and on my YouTube channel. Be sure to check out the other two lessons that I've already shared on in the first year of running my creative business, and also leave comments down in this video what other resources might be helpful for you as you run your creative career and your creative business or creative practice? I'm always listening and gathering feedback. Last but not least, I just really encourage you to leave me a like and subscribe to my channel if you like the content that you saw today. This will help you get notified for future content, but also help other creatives to discover this channel.